Welcome. Welcome to First Thursdays with Sustainable Tulsa. Thank you so much for being here today. We've got a great program on water. Actually, our last First Thursday program, uh, we had the candidates for District 4, and one of the questions was about water. So great timing. Uh, we've got some uh, uh, great panelists to be able to answer your questions and share what's going on. But before we get started, I want to thank uh, PSO. There's a big table of PSO members back there. They're our lead sponsor for First Thursdays. I want to give them a big thank you. <laughs> and also want to thank our other sponsors, which are uh, Cavanta, uh, Matt, you're, everybody knows Matt. <laughs> if you don't, you should know. Uh, TCC Center for Creativity, thank you, Mike. All right, woo! Uh, Mike McCann with McCann Law. Uh, PSO Wind Choice, Grog Screen Barn, and our newest member, One Oak. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. It's, it's without, without their support, we wouldn't be able to bring these programs to you. So thank you very much to our sponsors for that. And without you coming, we wouldn't have an event. So uh, thank you for joining us. Also want to give a thank you to my board members that are here today, Mike Lemus, uh, Matt Newman, James Williams, Carrie Rowland, and I think uh, Tracy Poe will be here at some point. Anyway, I, I thank them as well for their leadership. Uh, I want to thank our volunteers. We And wave back there, our volunteers. We have Ann Savage, Alex O'Connell, uh, Natalie Gajon, Cade, and I don't know your last name, Cade, but thank you for being here. And intern, Will Breer, let's thank them for all their volunteer time. And our latest member to the Sustainable Tulsa team is Jill Maud. She met you as you were signing in. Give a wave there, Jill. We are thrilled to have Jill. Woo! Uh, Jill uh, will be keeping us organized as the office specialist, so we thank you. And please make a point to say hello uh, on your way out. Um, so as a reminder, we also have composting and recycling here for you, uh, full sun composting. Natalie, I see you walked in earlier, so thank you for helping to do that. TCC manages uh, the recycling efforts, and, and so we thank them for making sure that we're sustainable. Uh, we want to take, we're gonna take one minute, this is a new thing that we've been doing, uh, instead of passing the mic like we used to do when we first started and we had 10 people or 20 people that came to these meetings, uh, we now are just taking one minute to stand up and introduce yourself to somebody you have not met, want to meet, you've seen around. Who are they? Take one minute, go. Oh, I got some water too. Yes, yes. Yeah. thank you. <laughs> I assume we'll be getting up that mic. Yeah. Click her presentation and all that. <laughs> It's always hard to get them to tease back, but they do it so quickly and they're so good at it, so, <laughs> so I can't stop it. Uh, Corey, I was thinking back the other day to when we were at Low Tank. A Low Tank, 10 people, uh -huh. literally. Yes. So it was, yeah, it was, a, it was just a big, you know, coffee chat where right. people would go by to the bathroom and interact with the center. Yeah, that was cool. I think you have 80 or 90 people here right now. Yeah. I tried to get down a little bit. Yeah, the, with the cannon. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being friendly and introducing yourselves. Okay, we'll have more time for that as well because we want you to stick around afterwards. Um, but uh, just a couple quick updates before we get into the program. So Sustainable Tulsa, we um, have our big uh, new fundraiser, which is Recharge, and it is September 
14th. It'll be at Kane's Ballroom, and we want you to be there with us. This is our first fundraiser on our own. We're growing up, and it's going to be so fun. It's about people, profit, planet, and we're going to we'll have that those themes. It'll be music. It'll be food. It'll be build-outs of experiences. So people are going to leave saying, that tastes good, that was fun, and did you know? And they're going to learn something. So anyway, we would love to have you join us. If you're interested in learning more or want to buy tickets, we have Alex. Alex, wave back there at the back table there. She will help you out there and uh, please join us and be a part of the fun. And we're just going to take this and bring it up like 10 notches. So uh, join us, okay? Um, also, we have, um, and you can go to our website and learn more about uh, who's joining us and who some of our uh, celebrity judges or celebrity chefs are. We also have our scorecard program, which is helping businesses with their triple bottom line. We will be celebrating in this room August 30th. It's part of our B2B program. We will be celebrating the results of all those teams that participated this last year. As a reminder, last year, 31 companies participated collectively. They saved a million dollars and did almost 900 action items toward their triple bottom line. Just a little teaser, almost 1,200 items this year. So it's we've seen really uh, an amazing amount of success with businesses wanting to engage and be more sustainable in our community. And we're excited to celebrate them coming up. And if you are a scorecard member or a, or a coach, wave your, wave your hands up in the air. So yeah, we have many in here. If you're interested in learning more about that, thank you for all your um, activity and support in that. It's, we're excited to celebrate. Uh, and again, that'll be here August 30th uh, from 8 to 10. Uh, we'll get started a little earlier with some food, and we hope you'll join us. Uh, one other addition, we received some funding, and we're going to take Scorecard to the schools. So we have, we're doing a pilot year, and we'll have Scorecard in three schools in this area as a pilot, where not only will they participate like any other Scorecard member, but the teachers are going to get paid to participate. They're going to get money toward their school and they're gonna be more sustainable and those kids are gonna learn about jobs within the sustainability realm. So we're super excited about that and we'll definitely update you as, uh, with more information to come. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> so really, really good stuff going on. But today we're gonna to talk about water. There's, it's a lot to cover and a lot of great stuff that we have people working on for us uh, in this community and, and how you can be engaged in that. So we have today uh, Jacob Hagen. He's currently the stormwater quality manager for the city of Tulsa. Jacob has been assigned to ensure that Tulsa's compliance with all aspects of its stormwater quality permit, pesticide general permit, and transfer station permit. He oversees a staff of 11 and has a BS in wildlife biology from Murray State University and MS in wildlife ecology and management from the Oklahoma State University. And you can see some of his staff here. They, they really, so wave if you're part of Jacob's staff. Yeah. They really helped to set up a really cool display here. So uh, let's welcome Jacob. Um, thank you all. And uh, we also have Sam Payton. He is a native of Owasso, serves as Director of Government Affairs for the Tulsa Regional Chamber. He advocates in policy issues in the areas of energy, environmental resources, transportation, and economic and economic development. Prior to working with the chamber, Sam worked as a legislative analysis for the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee in Washington, D.C., and in this capacity, he met with members of Congress and their staff to collaborate on legislation related to international water and energy projects, as well as homeland security initiatives. Sam has a Master's of Business Administration uh, from, uh, with a focus on energy and a Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science, both from the University of Oklahoma. Wow, we've got quite a panel. Uh, two panelists that are going to be able to share with you. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay. All right. There we go. Uh oh, I think that was right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And again, my name is Sam Payton. I'm from the Tulsa Chamber. I'm happy to be here. You know, Corey asked me to come speak on water issues and. I'm not sure I'm the biggest water expert, but I'm really good at getting all the experts in the room together to collaborate on issues. Um, so I want to take the next 10 minutes or so to talk about our efforts at the Tulsa Chamber, what we're doing with our stakeholders in the region in order to see what we can do with water in the future in Northeast Oklahoma and across the state. So we have a regional water policy task force at the Chamber. 
about 25 folks from across Northeast Oklahoma. And they are dedicated to engaging key stakeholders in our region to identify future water needs for economic growth and quality of life while developing a concerted strategy to ensure resource resilience, as you can see with the great PowerPoint behind me. Um, so about two years ago, we started this water policy task force, and it was formed with a very small group of businesses, local officials, and tribal leaders uh, from across our region to discuss the future of water in Northeast Oklahoma. And I see several of them in the room, so when we get to tough questions later, I'm gonna pick on them and make them answer. Um, so although our region has very abundant and vast water resources, we recognize that might not always be the case. Um, as we've seen in other areas of the state, when there are water shortages or droughts, it can be very devastating for our quality of life, for citizens, and economic development, which is one of the core missions of the chamber. Water planning for our region will provide greater awareness of our strengths, weaknesses, and allow us to address challenges that we face um, for availability and infrastructure issues. So as I briefly mentioned earlier, Southwest Oklahoma and Northwest Oklahoma were in drought and water shortage periods several years ago. So they had the availability or the opportunity to come up with some water plans. Um, the Oklahoma Water for 2060 was also out there. And so Northeast Oklahoma, a few folks at the chamber and our partners, we got together and we said, well, why don't we have a water plan too? We really need to address this. Some people came back to us and said, you don't need a water plan. You have so many lakes and streams and rivers. You guys are great. You'll never have a drought. Well, saying never, you know, what if, what if it does happen? We don't want to get caught. We need to be prepared. So a drought contingency effort was kind of uh, coming together, but also we recognized that that might be a side issue because we do have all these great resources. So what other issues can we tackle um, as a regional coalition? For one, economic development became a huge key. How can we address you know, the needs of our businesses and future businesses. At the Chamber, we want to improve the quality of life for not just Tulsa, but all of our communities around Tulsa, all of the region of Northeast Oklahoma. We want to keep people and their families here and businesses. We want to bring people and families and businesses here. So how can we leverage our water assets throughout the region for economic development and improving our quality of life? That was kind of the first key issue, and it's going to be one of the big themes of our water plan that we're seeking to create. The second is addressing infrastructure needs. I know infrastructure has been a really big topic at the federal level and state for a long time, but it's really coming to head right now. I mean, we have crumbling infrastructure, and not just water, I'm talking about roads and bridges and things like that too, but we're talking about water here and we need to be able to have infrastructure to provide for our citizens. And so we've been talking about ways uh, to address our infrastructure, what are the needs there, and also, how do we fund it? Um, one of the advocacy issues we work on at the Tulsa Chamber and um, a lot of our partners for a while that has nothing to do with just our water task force, but our bigger legislative agenda is municipal funding diversification. So not sure how many of you know, but Oklahoma is one of the few states, if not the only one, that restricts municipalities to sales tax as its only source of revenue. So that really hinders what we can pay for as a community. So at the chamber, we've been advocating for years on trying to get the legislature to pass some measure that would allow for us to send to a ballot measure for our citizens to allow to see, you know, how do we want to fund our own communities rather than just using sales tax, which can be a pretty unreliable source of revenue and downturns of the economy. Um, so. We're working on that continuously. There was a few bills. One died in the legislature last year, but um, there are other avenues we're going to seek to do, and that will help address water infrastructure and education, which is on everybody's minds. How do we fund public safety? So that's something that plays into this, how do we fund our infrastructure needs? So after economic development and infrastructure, our committee also looked at how do we balance the needs of all the stakeholders across Northeast Oklahoma? So we have energy production. There's great hydropower in our region. We have environmental needs. Municipalities who supply and uh, buy water. And also recreation. So I, I'm pretty sure, and you, somebody yell at me and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know we have a lot of lakes in Oklahoma. 
I think all of them are man-made, every single one. Um, and obviously, those weren't created for recreational needs decades ago when they were, when they were made. But recreation is now a huge part of our state. It's a huge part of our region. People love to go to the lake. They have homes on the lake. They love to play there. It's a big part of tourism and brings in a lot of people and sales tax and, and great things for our state. It really promotes who we are in Northeast Oklahoma. So we need to balance the needs of everybody, recreation, power. And so we're getting all these folks in the room to work together. And we need to make sure that our policy matches everybody's needs. Um, there's going to be a continuous struggle. Everybody's not always going to get along. But as long as we're in the same room together and talking about what we need, then that's better than not being together. And so we always have to make sure that uh, we're doing what's best for our citizens so we can always have good, reliable sources of water. And finally, one issue that we're looking at now that wasn't even on our radar when we started this task force was workforce development. Throughout our conversations as a task force, you know, we, it was always the big issues, infrastructure, economic development like I've been talking about. And then we got to talking to people and they said, you know, workforce is a much bigger issue. And that, that's really across the board, you know, you hear about workforce issues so much. But at our municipality level, they're telling us that they're not able to bring in always the best qualified, um, ready to go engineers or water staff for their departments. And when they are able to bring in qualified folks, they're not able to keep them there that long because we can't pay them what they deserve. And so they go to other engineering firms elsewhere. Um, so we're trying to see if there are ways we can collaborate with career tech and higher ed institutions in our region to really equip students and young folks with those, those career uh, qualifications where they can go and meet the needs of our municipalities and suppliers and things like that. So that's also something we're gonna try to work into our water plan for the region. Um, so that, those are kind of the biggest issues we're looking at right now. There's my slide. So what have we done thus far? Again, kind of like I mentioned, two years ago we got together and we held uh, a water summit. We brought in some of the best policy experts from across the state to talk about water issues and really lay a solid foundation for where we want to go. And then subsequent meetings after that, our steering committee met several times every few months to lay out our goals and the direction of where we want this to go. We continued seeking who's not in the room, who do we need to be here, who are the experts that really can give us some good insight into all these water issues. Eventually we broke down the steering committee into two subcommittees and that wasn't just members from uh, the steering committee, we brought in a lot of other folks too who weren't part of the process yet. And those subcommittees were economic development so we brought in a lot of the ED folks from cities, other chambers, businesses like Pepsi and American Airlines who use a lot of water. And we wanted to see what are your needs right now? Where do you see your business growing in the next 10, 20, 30 years? And what can our region, what can our folks do to help that? And our infrastructure and water quality task force was a lot of the engineers, and I am not an engineer, so a lot of that was over my head, but it was great conversation. It was what are the infrastructure needs, and how do we make sure we have good quality for our citizens? And I tell you, I got back from a trip from North Africa a few weeks ago, and there are a lot of people who don't have the water that we have. And we can't take that for granted, but we still have a ways to go we still need to address this. We can't let people tell us that we have such great resources here that we don't need to do anything about it. So after the steering committee met, the subcommittees met, we started to formulate an RFP to send to potential consultants. We got that together in early June, sent that out. We got proposals back uh, in mid-July. And actually, just next week, we're gonna get together with our uh, steering committee and review the proposals. We may make a decision, we may need to have another meeting, but this is really coming together um, really well right now and we're excited that it's happening and we hope to have a plan started by early 2019. This is something that's gonna be great for all of Northeast Oklahoma and this is really the first time some of us, we, we've shared it at other parts, but we love getting out here, people from our steering committee and I see Matt Newman who everybody knows from Covanta has had the opportunity to speak about this at some events too. And we really, it's all about awareness. We want people to be aware that 
we are going to have a plan for Northeast Oklahoma, just like other regions and other states have created, and it's a really big deal. Some people just think, oh, you got a 50 or 100 page plan for water, you know, cool, what's in it? Neat. But this is really big for the next few decades as Tulsa's booming right now. Our regions, our communities outside of Tulsa are booming, and we need to prepare for the influx of people and businesses that are gonna be here. So again, early 19, we hope to get that started and really off the ground, and that'll take a couple years. This is something that's not gonna happen in six months or so. But we're really excited what's happening. Um, other than that, you know, I handle water issues, environmental issues at the Tulsa Chamber. I love advocating for it. I was talking to Jacob earlier and about what we do. We're sharing kind of our, our insights on our jobs. And I said, well, I'm a lobbyist. And somebody said, you know, people think, oh, lobbyists, you know, you're criminal, crooked, all that stuff. But <laughs> no, I'm an advocate for Northeast Oklahoma. I get to go tell our elected officials day in and day out these awesome things about our city and our region and try to advocate for things here. And it's awesome. So everybody needs an advocate, everything. I get to go talk about transportation and education and how these things are really great. And we got some good people working here together on that stuff. So um, we're doing great things. If you're interested in what we're doing, feel free to talk to me. And if you have any ideas about what we can do to better our region, I'd love to hear it. So thanks, and that's what we're doing right now. Oh, I actually have a couple more things, real quick. I just wanted to show you this slide briefly because I'm really bad at slides. I kept forgetting to change these. I'm glad you guys are cool though. So uh, these are inside the city, our top water com customers and outside the city. So you know, this is something that a lot of folks were unaware of um, before we started looking at this. And it's pretty interesting just to see you know, who's buying water at these mass levels. Also, la very last one, I only have four slides. So the Northeast Oklahoma Park, the Middle Arkansas and Grand Watershed, that is the area we're talking about for our plan. So it should include a really good chunk of our region. So now I'm done. <laughs> Tell you. All right, thanks, Sam. Um, unlike uh, Sam here, I was talking about the difference in our presentations. He was a um, few slides, and um, I am lots of slides. <laughs> I uh, got a little over eager, overzealous when I started putting this together, so unfortunately, I'm gonna have to be um, flying through some of this stuff. It's already a little bit of a complicated topic, so I don't mean to. Um, go through things too quickly or, um, scam over, or um, scan over things that deserve more time, but um, hopefully we'll get through all this together. Again, I'm Jacob Hagan. I'm the Stormwater Quality Manager for the City of Tulsa. I've been in this role about uh, a year and a half now, I think. There it goes. Okay. So um, is that too close? <laughs> Got to bend over. Maybe does it come up? No. Nope. Okay. All right. I'll bend over. So some ancient history. Um, a lot of you guys have heard about all the industrial pollution in uh, the past two centuries. Um, we weren't always as aware of some of the impacts that we have as now. Um, one of the main catalysts for the program that I'm in are some of the uh, industrial pollution that happened back in Ohio in the 60s and 70s. You guys have probably all heard of the Cuyahoga River fire. The um, uh, river actually caught on fire not just once, but like a dozen times. So that just gives you an idea of how polluted that waterway was. Um, again, that was the catalyst for some legislation that collectively is called the Clean Water Act. And um, the goal of those programs originally were to deal with industrial pollution. They later found out that they could um, control those sources of pollution, but then they have to deal with stormwater runoff. So that's where um, my group came into existence. Um, back in 1993, I like to joke with my boss that I was seven years old then. Um, he's been with the program since the very beginning. I think Corey even worked for the program back in the day. I won't tell you how old she is through that. <laughs> 
Um, but now we have a staff of 11, and um, we have a, our programs growing more and more robust every day. Um, so what does the permit, what does the program require of us? Um, it's a big permit. If you want to look it up, it's online. Um, to boil it down into one slide doesn't do it justice, but one goal that um, kind of summarizes it is no discharge of pollutants in quantities that would cause a violation of Oklahoma's water quality standards. Um, those are standards that the state and the EPA sets as limits that our water quality cannot exceed. Um, those are to keep both the um, critters and human health um, on the up and up, basically. Um, one of the programs that I'm going to be talking to you mostly about today is our watershed characterization program. There's three parts to it. Um, I won't be able to cover all three of them, um, but the first two I will be able to talk more about. And as I said, there is a lot of information online about these programs, which if you are interested in reading or have insomnia, you can go online and find and put yourself to bed at night reading them. They're at that website there at the bottom. Um, before we jump into that, though, we need to do a little background homework. Um, you didn't think you were going to get quizzed today, but here we go. Everybody know the difference between a sanitary sewer and a storm sewer? Only one of them gets treated, okay? Some people think that, oh, that storm drain at the end of my street, I can dump whatever I want it, and it's going to go to the treatment plant, and it's going to come out cleaner. Definitely not, okay? So there's only one of our uh, sewers that gets treated. That's our wastewater uh, sanitary sewer system that takes your drains from inside your home, takes them to a treatment plant, it gets treated before it gets discharged. The storm sewer is not treated before they get discharged to our waterways. So um, if you didn't know that, good. And if someone you know doesn't know that, now you can tell them. Um, other background, what is a watershed? Um, Hopefully everyone knows, after Sam just mentioned it, that we are in the Arkansas River watershed. It is the uh, major watershed for our area. Um, I'm going to tell you about some of the other smaller watersheds that we monitor, but basically a watershed is the area of land from which all the precipitation that falls onto it uh, drains into a single waterway. Corey, this doesn't look like it's... Maybe I can do this. Is that better? Try that. Um, this is a map of the watersheds we monitor. There are about 30 of them up there. Hopefully you can see them. Um, we do that watershed characterization monitoring I was talking about a little bit earlier where we do um, analytical samples, biological samples, and habitat samples. Um, hopefully you can see the little uh, kind of magenta purple dots up there are our sampling locations. And that doing it this way just helps us break down some of the pollutant sources that get into our waterways in a more manageable way. If we tried to track back pollution on the Arkansas River, you can imagine how far we could go up before we found the source of that. So that's why we break it down into these smaller watersheds. Um, a little more about our program. Um, hmm. This is an old version of my presentation. That's fine. I might go try to grab it because, I'm sorry. I apologize for this, guys. There were some things in here that I'd updated recently that I don't want to... Um, miss out on. Okay. So there are the watersheds. Okay. Yep. This is the right one. So uh, 2011 to 2015, we monitored um, all those watersheds on that last map. There's 30 of them. Uh, we did those four different categories up there, fish, aquatic insects, analytical samples, which is going just to take water samples, and then the stream habitat. So some results, which hopefully everyone is most interested in. Um, the results from our fish sampling, again, the, bi the biological character critters that we monitor are indicators of how healthy our streams are doing. So some species are more intolerant to pollution and some are more tolerant. Depending on the ones we find, we can tell a little bit how healthy that stream is. Um, Tulsa's got a lot of really cool fish left in its streams. Um, the uh, graph over there on the right 
shows the um, number of streams that are supporting the water quality standard as well as the ones that are kind of in the middle, not good but not bad. Um, it's a pretty good number. About two-thirds of our streams are either uh, supporting or undetermined. So that's pretty good for an urban setting. Um, we're pretty happy with that. Uh, we're still working hard to get those streams that are impaired that don't have the fish community that we want um, improved. But overall, we have a lot of cool species. They're over there in our fish tank. I encourage you guys to go over there and check them out. Um, some of them, you know, you'd think they came from the Amazon rainforest or somewhere. And our darters and our long-eared sunfish are really, really interesting species. Uh, here's a map, just a real quick um, takeaway from the map showing uh, red light, green light, um, red, or yellow, excuse me. Um, green is the best ones. Those are the ones that are meeting their uh, water quality standard. And those are the ones more kind of on the outskirts of town, more natural streams. Um, you can see some of the smaller streams uh, toward the more central part of town, the more developed parts of town. Those are the ones that are um, having a little more difficulty meeting that condition. Uh, anyone want to take a guess of which fish species is most likely to be found in Tulsa? Not from my group. <laughs> Cart, perch. Oh boy. <laughs> I won't. I won't. I'll find you later. <laughs> um, green sunfish. It is the most uh, abundant fish species in town. It's very tolerant, unfortunately. Um, I mean, it's still a cool species to find, but um, after nuclear. Holocaust and World War III, cockroaches are going to be on the land and green sunfish are going to be in the water. Um, <laughs> this, this guy is a survivor. Um, that fish over there on the right is from Brook Hollow Creek in town. It's a ditch of a creek, I mean just a trickle of a creek. And this guy is about a pound and a half and he was just living large. He was enjoying life, <laughs> eating everything. Um, but they're survivors and that's one of the most abundant fish we find. Uh, so some results from our benthic or aquatic insect monitoring, you know, as science guys, we like to make simple things tough. So benthic macroinvertebrate is the technical term, and that means bottom dwelling large enough to see with eye and have no backbone insects. So we'll, we'll just go with um, aquatic insects. But anyway, our benthic numbers showed a little bit more um, difficulties meeting the water quality standards. Um, we weren't able to take as many samples as we would have liked for that program. Um, we are taking those now. Uh, we changed our program around a little bit, but still a lot of um, streams meeting their um, water quality standard as well as in that undetermined category. So for an urban setting, you know, um, you, this is, it's dif difficult to do with these critters. Um, they have a lot of impacts coming to them both physically and chemically. Um, so this isn't too bad of a start. Uh, this picture here, it's not, a, it's not a great photo, I'll say, but um, it is one of our most intolerant species. Uh, we weren't able to find this one in Tulsa until 2015. Um, don't judge me, but I think I might have cried when we finally found it. Um, we're very happy to see some of those intolerant species still in town. This is a stone fly, by the way. That's what uh, Mr. Hood back there and his Trout Unlimited group, they mimic when they go fly fishing. So anybody want to finish this sentence? Benthics are bad to the... Bone, no, exoskeleton, right? <laughs> I said intervertebrates don't have bones, so they're bad to the exoskeleton. They're so cool. Um, long before Transformers came out as a movie, they were the original ones. Um, they've been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. This is a local one we have here on the bottom right. It's a Helgramite. It has a very cool life cycle. Um, after a couple years living in our streams, they transform into that crazy looking thing on the right called a Dobson fly. It looks like he would eat your hand off, but it's all for show, that's a male. The females are the ones you gotta watch out for. I think it's good life advice also. <laughs> um, but they need clean water to survive. So um, we're lucky enough to have a few of these in our streams and we'd like to have more of them. So that's one of the ones we're on the lookout for. Um, benthics, just like our other insect species are incredibly diverse. If, you have kids at home over the summertime and you know you need something for them to do tell them to go out in the backyard and find bugs because there are hundreds and hundreds of them they would be out there for days trying to count how many bugs species we have out um, just in your backyard this is a table that one of my colleagues put together of all the different species or types of uh, benthic we found in town as you can tell it goes not only to two three four five six seven eight nine slides over 160 species um, in Tulsa for an urban environment. This is a, is a pretty good 
um, starting place. This is just the beginning of our program, so we hope over time to increase that number and find more and more species in town. Um, so some of the results from our analytical or water monitoring. Um, overall, we found that Tulsa streams are pretty healthy analytically. Um, we took a lot of samples. These gentlemen over here on the left end, they were in the room somewhere else, but they have over the course of these four years taken thousands and thousands of water samples. Um, and we found our streams to be doing fairly well. Um, most of them had one or fewer impairments. Those are the violations of water quality standards and one of the most common impairments is bacteria, and I'll be talking about that in further detail here in a little bit. Um, how, okay. Maybe like two minutes. Two minutes, oh my gosh. <laughs> bad, 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 okay. <laughs> so combine our data with um, some of the data that the state's collected, because they also do some sampling in town, and you'll see um, this graph here, this is some of the parameters that aren't meeting their water quality standards. I apologize because I'm going to start flying here. This is a map of them. All these streams in red and green are the ones that are in violation. They add up to about 20 streams. So, we're, oh my gosh, sky's falling. Uh, impairments everywhere in Tulsa. What are we to do? Well, let's settle down for a second and think about what other streams in the state are also impaired for bacteria. Well. Um, anybody heard of Blue Hole Swimming uh, area out on Saline Creek? That is also impaired for bacteria. Um, Flint Creek up off of Highway 412 just before you get to the Arkansas border. Thousands, not, well, probably thousands every year, but yeah, lots of people recreate up there. Hope I don't change anyone's weekend plans. The Illinois River, bacteria. Um, this is public information, so I hope I'm not um, ruining anyone's weekend. But lots of streams are impaired for bacteria, not just One's in Tulsa. When you look at the statewide assessment, it's the two most common pollutants statewide, the two types of bacteria. Um, in this regard, Tulsa streams are similar to the rest of the state. Um, lots of people recreate in the Illinois River and those other streams I mentioned, and they don't um, have, you know, weird gross going off them or not uh, masses of people getting hospitalized. So just because there's an, an impairment doesn't mean the water is necessarily unsafe. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, just willy-nilly go out there, let your guard down and start drinking the water without being treated, but um, you just got to take precautions. So our group is actively trying to improve the impairments we have in Tulsa, especially bacteria. Oh, um, real quickly last, what about the Arkansas River? Um, a lot of questions about that. It's a big one. It's the biggest one in town. Um, its watershed goes way back to Colorado, over a thousand miles long um, at its discharge to the Mississippi. Um, we've been monitoring it since 2016. Analytically speaking, it's doing fairly well. We found the same impairments that the state has found, namely bacteria and turbidity issues mostly. Uh, we don't sample it for our biota. Uh, at the city, as a dedicated city employee though, I go on the weekends and sample the biota myself. And as you can see, the fish population is doing fairly well not only myself fishing, but our resident bald eagle populations. Uh, we have a very robust bald eagle population that wouldn't be here without the um, health of the Arkansas River the way it is. So those are good things. Um, shovel nose sturgeon are also calling it home. Our um, Department of Wildlife is doing some studies to try to determine um, how well they are doing. So more news to come there. Um, what can you do to help? I'll cut myself off here. Just go over to our booth. There's lots of information. Uh, literature, ways you can help, activities coming up, and um, I think I'll stop there, Corey, if that's all right. Thirty seconds. That'll be easy because Jacob stole all of my thunder. I mean, that's pretty much it. Everything that Jacob was talking about, we have our information on those subjects. Um, the best way for us to change some of those numbers is through public education. All right. Um, so that's what we're here doing. We're passing all kinds of information. We've brought some examples of fish from local streams in the city of Tulsa. These guys came from Mooser Creek. Um, and uh, anything you want to know, we'll answer any questions you got. Thanks. My name is Tim Lovell. I'm with the Disaster Resilience Network. 
we empower people, businesses, and communities to reduce the impact of disasters before they happen. And we have been working closely with the city of Tulsa on the National Flood Insurance Program, which had its 50th anniversary yesterday. Yeah, big deal. And we do public education messaging, including about low impact development, the same topic that our colleagues here from the city are talking about. LID improves water quality and quantity. Take some time to get to know us. We're a nonprofit. We're looking for people to become involved with us and assist us in making our community stronger. Hi, I'm Sarah Ivey with the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality. We're the state regulatory agency overseeing air, land, and water issues. So I brought some water information with me today, but if you have questions on a variety of environmental topics, I'd be happy to get you more information. Uh, I'm Graham Brannon um, with the Metropolitan Environmental Trust. This is Bryce Davis. He's our educator. And uh, compost is good for your health. So uh, it's also good for stream health. So come by and talk to us about it. What I really want to say is that everybody at these tables, we all know each other. And we work together. We work with Corey and others. So um, we promote each other's programs. We're working together for the good of the community. And so just latch on to somebody at one of these tables because we'll get it done together. Crow Creek. Oh, yeah, well, it's always a beautiful day at Crow Creek. And somebody else might talk about that, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Scott Hood. I'm with uh, Oklahoma River Warriors. Uh, we are not only nonprofit, we are non-funded. Uh, we, <laughs> we are a total volunteer organization. I, I come to these things to try to find uh, organizers who are interested in cleaning up their favorite spot on a river, stream, or a lake. Uh, you become the organizer, I become the event coordinator for you, and we try to organize a cleanup. We've done a number of these uh, in Tulsa. I'm here because of Jacob uh, sponsored our first one on the Arkansas River in December of 19 or 2015, I guess it was. Anyway, uh, uh, water's life. Uh, Water, without it, we're not going anywhere. Uh, a quick uh, commercial for myself. In four minutes this morning, I picked up this pile of trash outside of my office. Its destination is the Gulf of Mexico. This is our watershed. We owe it to ourselves to keep it clean. And I invite you to come over, pick up a brochure, and become an event coordinator for me. Hi, I'm Ann Money with the Oklahoma Aquarium, and uh, if you want to come over here later, I can kind of talk to you about what the messaging that I give to about 30,000 students that come through our building every year. Uh, one of the, the big topics that I focus on is our connection here in the, in the middle of the country with the ocean, and specifically with uh, the important habitats like coral reefs and kelp forests and where big fish go to have baby fish that don't get eaten by other big fish, and also riparian zones and how important riparian zones are to the health of our local streams, our local rivers, and therefore our oceans. So, thank you. I'm Jean Lemon with the Oklahoma Conservation Commission, here today representing Blue Thumb, which is our public education arm. Um, we have been very active in the Tulsa area. Today we're talking about the three aspects, the chemical quality of the water, the physical habitat, and the biota that lives there. Uh, we do have a lot of citizen scientists who have been very active in our program, and we have a very active group here in the Tulsa area. We will be holding additional trainings later this fall, and if you are interested in doing that kind of thing, we would love to have your help. Thank you all so much. And as you can see, and there's other organizations that couldn't make it today. There's more, as Graham put it, they all work together and, and trying to improve our water quality and the education around that. But we have a few minutes left for questions from the audience. So if you have a question for our panelists or even for one of the booths, uh, let us know. 
Great presentations. My name is Kara Joy McKee. I'm running for Tulsa City Council District 4. And I'm looking at your map, Jacob, thinking, OK, that's Crow Creek, I think, and impaired right there in District 4. And I know that we have an, uh, a volunteer organization working on helping with the impairment in Crow Creek. What kind of response have you received from neighborhood associations and other organizations to be able to help with that impairment? Your guys said neighbors ed education, but, but tell, us, tell us a little bit more. Um, good question, thanks for asking that. Um, Jean Lemon over here wears two hats. She's not only the Blue Thumb coordinator, but she also heads up the Crow Creek community um, project. Uh, the community response has been good. Um, we've had a lot of folks interested in it. Um, sustaining their interest in it has been difficult. Um, that's not just in Crow Creek, though. It's citywide. Um, this, the Crow Creek one is the first watershed group we've done, and um, it's been a learning experience. Um, the interest is there, um, but sustaining it is difficult. Um, with our education program um, being as small as it is for as a big a city as Tulsa is, um, you always have to keep people interested. So that's been difficult, but um, there's definitely been some interest in Crow Creek, which we're very appreciative of. Um, with the gathering place coming online, there's a real emphasis on recreating in the Arkansas River. A lot of kayaking, there are gonna be a lot of kids splashed around in the water. My question for you is, and I know that some city officials have said that uh, you should swim in the Arkansas River. Is it safe uh, to swim, to be splashing around in the Arkansas River? Wow. <laughs> um, that's, that's a very difficult one. It's always going to be tough to say that the rivers, our natural waters, are always going to be safe. Um, you know, it, we are diligently monitoring our waterways to ensure that they're safe to recreate in. Um, but the, no telling what could happen at any time upstream. Um, something could happen outside of the city limits that you know we have no jurisdiction over. So um, being able to answer that um, is, is difficult. Uh, we are always doing our best to monitor the um, waterways. And if something um, were to um, make, as you said, the people recreating in the river unhealthy, we would um, definitely be on top of that to um, ask you guys not to get in there and um, potentially um, injure yourself like that. I had a different take on the chamber presentation about the water planning. Uh, the, one of the bullet points had infrastructure in there, and it made me think about the, I guess it's called the Kerr McClellan our, our barge canal, which for years has been, I've heard, it's missing some locks, and if we have droughts, it goes dry, and that really could be an economic, I mean, that's one of our assets here. And did your plan address that, or are you considering it? Yes, absolutely, and that's something that's also a part of our One Voice legislative agenda. We have a, a big regional legislative agenda that focuses on state and federal issues, and the McClellan Kerr Arkansas River Navigation System has been on that agenda as one of the top federal issues for many years. There's about a $155 million maintenance backlog of the entire system. There's part of the uh, waterway in Arkansas that could, if it flows, for, there's three rivers converging together, and if that, some of that floods, then the entire system would be um, unnavigable. So, Yes, we are addressing a lot of those maintenance issues, infrastructure needs. We work with the Port of Catoosa and Port of Muskogee all the time on their issues. That's something that um, we work with our senators and our members of the House um, on trying to get funds allocated to that too. And that's something that through the Water Resources Development Act at the federal level and after the election, if Congress feels like they would like to tackle a comprehensive infrastructure package, maybe MCARNs would be in that. That's definitely something that's on our radar. Okay, uh, a shameless plug. Go to the Crow Creek Community Facebook page if you wanna know what's going on at the Meadow. I think Corey wanted somebody to say something about that. And, and if you wanna come pull some weeds, tomorrow morning I will be there watering and you can pull weeds. It's a lot of fun and it is also good for your health. But anyway, question, Sam. Um, the One Voice, uh, could you touch a little bit on the what's going on with One Voice, specifically the group that you're involved with, uh, Energy and Environment? Sure. So I briefly 
mentioned our one voice agenda there and people probably had no idea what I was talking about. What's this one voice thing? So uh, about 10 or 11 years ago, the chamber started um, this process where we bring together business members, um, municipality leaders, and other chambers from across our region together to help formulate our annual legislative agenda. And this is something that very few chambers in America do. Several just have their board discuss issues and then vote on their agenda for the year. Um, we don't want this to be a chamber agenda. This is really a regional agenda created by our business members, our regional partners, uh, tribal leaders, things like that. Um, everybody comes together. We have nine different task forces that cover a spectrum of issues from education, healthcare, energy, small business, um, and one of those is our environmental resources task force. And I help facilitate that, but really we have a great chair for that committee, who is Corey. And uh, so she leads that task force and has for the past two years, and we, we have a slate of state issues that our members can promote and a slate of federal issues. And then at the this, this group only meets for a few times during the summer, and we've already had two meetings in our, our next meeting. Um, we will vote on our top three state and three federal issues. And the number one issue from each of those categories automatically makes it onto our regional legislative agenda for 2019. And then the other couple issues, the number two and three for each category, will make it onto the One Voice Legislative Summit, which is this big event we have every year where all participants, several hundred folks from all nine task forces come together and sit at round tables and discuss you know, here's what it, what's important with education, or, well, I was on the Environmental Resources Task Force, and here's what we're doing for conservation and water issues and things like that. And then they vote on some final issues. In the end, we'll have 15 state and 15 federal issues that make up our agenda. So it's a pretty unique process. Right now, we're uh, going over several issues uh, in our environmental resources, uh, water conservation, funding DEQ adequately. Um, yeah. yeah, hey, some DEQ folks. Um, a lot of our agencies need adequate funding, let me tell you. But um, others, a, a really unique one this year that Matt Newman brought to the task force is about curbing the opioid epidemic, which is really big in the Tulsa area, the state and the country. And what people don't understand is, you know, why is the opioid statement in the Business and Environmental Resources Task Force? Well, it affects our water a lot when people just drain or you know, flush their pills down the toilet and it ends up in our water stream. Matt likes to tell something very unique that the state of Washington did some testing on their mussels and clams outside and they tested positive for opioids. So this is an issue that should be on everybody's minds. It's something that we're gonna try to tackle at the state level. Um, a lot of, basically, we're trying to start a drug take back program at pharmacies because a lot of folks don't like to take their pills to law enforcement centers to get rid of them. So has to do with water quality. I know I ranted on a little bit there, but our task forces are doing really great work. So that's that. Quick question. Hi, my name's Kim Shannon. I'm with Mead and Hunt. And my question is kind of directed to you, Sam, but Jacob, you come into play also. And what you just talked about, Sam, kind of touches on a little bit. So for your 2019 water plan, you have all these different people advocating for development, which is very important for the city as a whole. But who is advocating for um, the need and necessity and importance of maintaining green spaces that go hand in hand with water quality? I'll use this one. Um, so green, I'll, I'll touch something on green spaces. So this water policy task force that I mentioned in my presentation is completely separate from our legislative agenda setting process. This is something that meets year round. It's a huge process. Um, we are, it has been on our agenda to advocate for conserving green space for our environmental resources task force. That's one of our policy issues at the state state level that we've really been working on. Um, for our water plan, Matt, I'm gonna, do you, do you have any insight into, I'm trying to think who, who we, we have about 25 people on our task force and I'm trying to go through my brain real quick and think of who on the task force is really talking about green space. That's, that's a really important component. Go 
ahead. I've got a voice for newsprint. Um, you answered it correctly, I think. You know, we're, we're really focused heavily on the water stakeholders, and it's a huge list of people that can participate. We've had tremendous participation. It's on our mind because it's part of quality. You know, it was on our mind because of what is coming to us from other states and what those other states are doing with poultry and hog farming and things like that. It's on our minds, you know, tip of our, top of our minds. But in the business environmental resource, Michael Patton actually introduced a task force agenda to talk about maintaining and increasing green spaces. And that is on the agenda. And even if it doesn't make it to the 15, mm -hmm. you know, state or 15 federal issues, it's on the chamber's agenda to talk at our capital about specifically that. Okay? So it's all of the circle of life. <laughs> Well, let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you, Jacob and Sam. A wealth of information. I know there were some other questions out there, but uh, stick around. We'll, uh, you know, talk to uh, the the booth goers there and uh, and visit with each other's other folks in the area. Their resources. And before we finish. Wow, Jacob brought a rain barrel uh, as the giveaway today. Wow. So if you win and you don't think you'll actually install it, then gift it to somebody that will or someone else in the room. That's just something because you've got to be willing to actually install it. Right. Okay. All right. So Jill is going to pull the winner today is James Jackson. So, oh, all right. Congratulations. So, um, very good. It's, it's at the front there. Uh, and one little quick wrap up with our scorecard. Um, this year, we have a water category, uh, over 135 action items from our 34 companies uh, toward water conservation. And that's doubling since last year's results. So we're seeing more and more increase on water uh, quality issues and things like that. So. Uh, Come to Recharge if you want to learn more about it. Jill's going to be back there to help you get signed up, buy tickets, stick around. Thank you very much. We'll see you next month.